Yes, good afternoon. Today is Wednesday, the 23rd of September, and today we're going to finally get into this unit on the Reformation Wars. But before we do that, let's uh, look at some pictures, shall we? Remember, the subject matter is Baroque. Okay, just going to show you uh, that Baroque is not just paintings. Baroque is um, a style of decoration. This is a Baroque shrine um, altar piece that I came across in uh, Christ the King Cathedral in Warsaw. Um, the thing about, you know, I went to Warsaw in 2016 to visit my son. Actually, I went to Poland. He was staying in a little town called Poznan. But of course, he was there uh, actually going to school. And so he really couldn't spend time with me. And so we, my, uh, I took my ex-wife. I'm the nicest man in the world. I took my ex-wife. She was my ex-wife when I took her because, you know, you do nice. And when I say I took her, I paid the whole way. But that's okay. Another story. Right, Mr. Arlinghouse? But anyway, uh, so we went to, uh, we got on a train. We actually took three train trips that week because I was there 12 days. And we took three train trips. We, uh, on Monday of that week, we went to Gdansk. Gdansk, which is on the Baltic Sea. Of course, you know where all these places are, right? Baltic Sea, Poland. And, uh, and of course, you know that Gdansk, as Mr. Arlinghouse can tell you, was not always called Gdansk. It was called Danzig. Yeah, I heard that. Mr. Arlinghouse, I could hear him yelling it from Connor. Uh, Danzig. And uh, so... Uh, we went there and just day trips. We take a train up there. I mean, trains in Europe are just so awesome. So we took a train there uh, and walked around Danzig. Uh, I'm sorry, Gdansk. And then uh, we, uh, on Wednesday, we took a train ride to Warsaw. Of all the cities I visited in Poland, Warsaw was my most favorite. But I'll tell you something about Warsaw. Um, in all, in fact, every Polish city except, except Krakow. Um, during World War II, uh, those cities, except Krakow, were basically turned into a parking lot. You see, um, as you all know, because you're smart students, uh, World War II officially begins in Europe even though really it began in Manchuria in 1931, but that's another story. But anyway, it begins in Europe uh, September 1st, 1939, with the Nazi invasion of Poland, uh, while at the same time uh, the Soviet Union was invading the other half which, of course, is something we don't really talk about that much because uh, you know, that's uh, we sided with the Soviets in World War II, and it would look, you know, it doesn't look good. History, according to Napoleon, and I like this, history is a lie agreed upon by everyone. Well, anyway, so here's the thing, though. When the Nazis took over their part of Poland, they actually did not do that much physical destruction. I mean, the uh, Nazi takeover of Poland was um, almost surgical. And we'll talk about that later, how they did it. But it really was. It was almost surgical. It was over with in two weeks. However, as you also know, and Mr. Arlinghouse is jumping up and down saying, uh, uh, as you also know, uh, on June the 22nd, 1940, uh, the Nazis launched Operation Barbarossa, a surprise attack upon the Soviet Union. And what happens then is that for much of the rest of the war, the Nazis and the Soviet Union 
are at war with each other, and Poland is the battleground. And they, the World War II turned Poland into a parking lot. Literally, every city. Uh, Warsaw, especially, was just completely destroyed. It was just bombed out, uh, totally. And say, so you say, well, Mr. Horton, what does this have to do with Baroque art? Well, after the war was over with, um, many cities in Europe were like that. Some cities, like in Germany, in Germany, they simply just cleared out the rubble and built modern cities, which is why if you go to Germany, you won't find any building except in Munich. Munich was out of the range, pretty much a bombing range of uh, American and British bombers. Um, so the cities of Germany, all of them have been built since the uh, since World War II ended. Their buildings are fairly modern. However, in Poland, what they actually tried to do, and they did it fairly convincingly, was to rebuild the city to make it look like what it looked like prior to World War II. And Warsaw did that. And they recreated Warsaw. Uh, one of the best places to visit in Warsaw is the Old Town, which it too was turned into a parking lot in World War II, but the Poles went back and they made it look the same. Uh, you know, made it look the same as it used to, only more pristine. And so, it, and that was the thing I'm originally getting to. In the, the Old Town in Warsaw, uh, there's a Roman Catholic church literally every 500 yards. I know because we walked the old town and there was one Catholic church after another. You do know, of course, that Poland is the most Catholic country in Europe. Even more by that, I mean the percentage of people in the country who are practicing Catholics. Poland is number one. Ireland is number two, which is many people would find surprising. Uh, both Poland and Ireland went through similar circumstances in that they're conquering countries, the British in Ireland, and of course the Soviet Union in Poland tried to basically squeeze their religion out of them. And what you find though in such a circumstance, you don't really stamp out a religion, uh, you basically make it stronger. Anyway, so yeah, this is Baroque you're looking at here. This altar is Baroque. But now let me show you what Baroque really looks like. Like I said, the only city in Poland that really didn't suffer that much during World War II, Krakow, the city of Oskar Schindler. Well, he, that wasn't the city he was from, but the city where, oh, if you've ever seen Schindler's List. Um, if you've never seen Schindler's List, go home and slap yourself. Um, but uh, yes, Schindler's List, I think, in my estimation, and I'm, I know about these things, but I love films. Schindler's List is the best film ever made. End of story. And it is shot, it took place in Krakow, and the film is shot in Krakow. Krakow, like I said, was not uh, really damaged by the war. Now, inside Krakow, the largest cathedral is called is St. Mary's Cathedral. And now we're going to go look at the interior. Um, I have to admit it, that when I went into many of these cathedrals, I was the ugly tourist. I would slip in and take a picture and just walk right out. I never really went in during a church service. Okay, I did. I'm sorry. In fact, I went in to St. Mary's during a wedding. Not lying. I'm sorry, all right? But it's beautiful. Look. Right there. Now this... is actually a film. I mean, look at that. You can barely see. You can barely see. Yeah, 
there is a wedding going on up there, and it can't it won't let me blow it up. But I guess it's hard. Yeah, there's a, a couple getting married up there. I know, but I mean, look at that. I mean, like Miss uh, Jasper, remember I was talking about yesterday? This is Baroque. How the ceiling look like the stars of the sky. And I mean, you know, everything's glitter and gold leaf. And this is Baroque. Okay. This is what the Roman Catholic Church was doing to attract people back into the folds of the Roman Catholic Church. Yeah. Now, of course, they didn't have electric lights. They had candles. But yeah, this is really nice. Um, and I was asked to leave. Shh, don't tell anybody. I mean, come on. I just, you know. All right, so on with the show. Let's talk about Reformation War, shall we? All right. In the Peace of Augsburg of 1552, and there it is, see that written in the Latin, Curious Regio, Iris Religio, the prince of each region chooses the religion of the region. The prince chooses the religion, but it did not make peace for all religions, as it did nothing for non Lutherans. Oh, yes. Notice there I talk about art and architecture. Catholic. Baroque. Now, what? Oh, this thing is just making me nuts. In Lorenzo Bernini. That is how it is. Uh, yeah. Uh, that was an attempt, as you saw with Rick Steve yesterday, to bring people back to the church. The Protestants were more simplistic. Uh, uh, Protestant churches, you know, look more plain. Yeah. Okay, now let's learn about something called politics. Politics, and here's that word, were rulers who used religion when it was convenient and did what was most expedient to further their career. You say, what does that mean? Uh, it means that uh, what you begin to see in Europe is the rise of, and Queen Elizabeth is actually a better example, pretty much, than anyone else. Queen Elizabeth, um, she was a perfect example of a politic. You say, why, but why was she a politic, Mr. Orton? Because she uh, was a Anglican born Anglican, and she was actually threatened by Mary, her older half-sister, and, you know, basically was, uh, they tried to co coerce her into uh, becoming a uh, Catholic, but she wouldn't. But at the same time, when she took power, she also would not enforce or force the ideas of Anglican on everybody she just she wanted to stay in power and so she set aside her own personal beliefs uh, to stay in power that is what a polity does they set aside their own personal convictions for the purpose of the betterment of state for staying in power etc 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 Philip II of Spain is exactly the opposite his name shouldn't even be there Philip II of Spain I don't know why his name is there uh, he was a real character you might remember that Philip II of Spain um, married Mary I. They were married. And so the king of Spain and the queen of England were married. Um, but, you know, it was one of those things where he hardly ever came around uh, because he was too busy doing other things. He proposed marriage to Elizabeth after his first wife died. Uh, but she uh, she dodged him. Okay, let's go on Roman rule three. Wars of religion in France match the Catholics, the majority, versus the Huguenots. Remember that name, Huguenots, French Calvinists, the followers of Biscanon Hughes. That's where the name comes from. So the edict 
of Fountain Blow, which was uh, passed by, uh, I think it's one of the de Medici queens, subjected French Protestants to the Inquisition. You say, what does that mean, Mr. Horton? It means that uh, this edict, Edict of Fontainebleau, basically said, we get to hunt down French Protestants and burn them at the stake. There, see, pretty simple. The Edict of Chateaubriand established new measures. When Henry II was killed accidentally, he fell off his horse. This gave a chance to three, three groups to rule in France. See, here's the thing. At this period of time in France and in many parts of Europe, even if that country had a king, in England too, for that matter, even if that country had a monarch, a king, there was kind of a debate over whether the king really was the most powerful person in the country or whether um the lords the nobility was the most powerful the countries that were most successful were the ones where the you know where the kings had successfully seized and controlled power so uh so three groups the one the family that will eventually grab power and will eventually uh become the monarchs who last the longest in France are the Bourbons. Yes, your, your question, is that where bourbon whiskey gets its name? Yeah, but you say, Mr. Horton, bourbon whiskey is made from corn in Kentucky. Why does it have a name like bourbon? Well, you have to remember that part of Kentucky, at one point in time, Kentucky was claimed by the French. Oh, I don't know, some guy named Louis as in Louisville? No. Yeah. And yeah, uh, Bourbon was named after the family as well as Bourbon County. Who knew? So anyway, um, the Bourbons, another family called the Montmorency Cotillions, and finally the Geeses. The Geeses were from eastern France. Uh, they were the strongest at the time and became equated with militant reactionary Catholicism. It is worth noting that Mary, Queen of Scots, Mary, Queen of Scots, was a geese. Yeah, she, uh, Mary, Queen of Scots, uh, moved to England to, uh, no, I'm sorry, Scotland, to marry, uh, one of the Stuarts. She might have, probably was, involved in his murder. And she might have, probably was, involved in a plot to kill her cousin, Elizabeth. Yeah, the Elizabeth, Queen of England. But yeah, she was a geese. She grew up in France, she spoke French, and then she had to, and was staunch Catholic, and then she had to move to Scotland. Yeah. Okay. Calvinism. Huguenotism. By 1561, there were 2,000 Huguenot congregations, churches, uh, in France. Now, notice this stat. More than two-fifths of the French aristocracy became Huguenots. French nobility. 40%. 40% of the French nobility became Huguenots. Well, you're saying, well, that's interesting, Mr. Horton. Why would, and by the way, the same wasn't true of the French peasantry, the French common people, not in any way, shape, or form. All the way through the French Revolution, the uh, French, the third estate, in France, the common people, the peasants and the serfs, remain staunchly Roman Catholic. However, um, more than two-fifths of the French aristocracy became Huguenots. You might be saying, now, why would they do that? Well, it just goes to show, Mr. Richmond, that uh, 
religion during this time was often used as a way to manipulate power. And see, for a lot of these members of the nobility, they might not have liked being told what to do by the Roman Catholic Church as they were being told what to do. And so for many of them, becoming uh, Huguenot meant freedom. Yeah. Uh, because the Calvinists were all about local self-control, uh, local control of the government. And so, yeah, a lot more than two-fifths of them have become Huguenots. Calvinist religious convictions, how do I make these spelling errors, were attractive primarily as aids to political goals. Why does that mean, Mr. Orton? It's what I just said, meaning that people became Calvinists so they could get out from under the Roman Catholic Church. Simple. Religious conviction was neither the only nor always the main reason for becoming a Calvinist in France in the second half of the, of the 16th century. What does that mean, Mr. Jordan? Same thing I just said. One of Calvinist's greatest opponents, though, was Marie, I'm sorry, Catherine de' Medici. And yes, de' Medici, of that de' Medici family, the Italian de' Medici family. Uh, the uh, the the ones that run ran Florence. Catherine de Medici um, was not only the wife of a king; she was the mother of kings. In 1562, after conversations with others, meaning uh, Catholic Church, she issued the January Edict, which granted Protestants freedom to worship publicly uh, outside of town. A compromise of sorts that ended when a Protestant congregation was massacred. Who writes this? Massacred by the Duke of Look at that Geese. These guys, the Geese, the Duke of Geese, and this was the beginning of the French Wars of Religion in 1562, the Catholic majority versus the Protestant minority. So, the Peace of Saint Germain, and that didn't help. The Peace of Saint Germain in Lie granted the Huguenots religious freedom with the uh, with their territories and the right to fortify their cities. Uh, Catherine. Maneuvered, and I know how to spell maneuvered, and that's not it. Is that not it either? Maneuver. Oh. That's dumb. I used to know how to spell maneuvered. M A N U V E R E D. That's not right. That's right, isn't it? Catherine maneuvered to avoid a religious war uh, within France that would place France in a war with Spain. You say, what does that mean? You see, France, uh, Catherine, very shrewd and very much afraid of Spain, the strongest country in Europe, wanted to avoid a war, uh, in other words, a circumstance that would invite Spain to invade them. If there is a Catholic Protestant war going on in France, the Spanish king, Philip II, might think it was his duty, because Philip II did everything the Pope told him. The, uh, it might, the Philip II might think it was his duty to invade Spain and set things right. And you say, that sounds really dumb and weird, Mr. Horton. It was often used as an excuse. Hmm. Is that right? Interesting. That's right, huh? Hmm. To avoid ever so um so yeah, Catherine uh was very impressed with the Spanish victory over the Turks at the Battle of Lepanto in 1571. 
Yeah, that naval battle uh, where the Spanish Navy overwhelmed the Turks in 1571, very impressive. How were the Spanish able to defeat the Turks? Answer, because the Spanish were banked, bankrolled by silver. Silver that they brought from the New World literally by the ton. And the Spanish uh, king, Philip II, used that to build a giant fleet, later on the Spanish Armada, to uh, turn the Turkish navy into uh, matchsticks. The Battle of Lepanto in 1571. On August 24, 1572, uh, Coligny and 3,000 Huguenots were butchered in Paris. This is, you know, this, uh, by the way, this is called the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre. Yeah. Three days later, an additional 20,000 Huguenots were killed. This is called the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre. St. Bartholomew's Day is a Catholic holiday for one of the many saints. Gregory the Thirteenth. Uh, the Pope and Philip II of Spain were very happy that all these Huguenots had been slaughtered. Protestants in Europe were now fighting for their very existence. Protestants, including John Calvin, began to take up the cause of resisting religious tyranny. Henry III was the last of Henry II's sons to wear the French crown. In the Peace of Bouillot, on May of 1576, granted Huguenots almost complete religious and civil freedom, but that was short-lived. The Catholic League uh, of France, which was a league of Catholic-dominated cities, forced the end of this treaty uh, the so in the so-called Day of Barricades, where a lot of the Huguenot cities had to quickly erect fortifications. Henry of Guise, I'm um, sorry, Henry, uh, Henry III plotted and committed the assassination, committed the assassinations, assassinations of the Duke and Cardinal of Guise. I know I'm distracting you with all these spelling errors. Assassinations. Yes, there it is. Assassinations of the Duke and Cardinal of Geese. You know, the Geese family, the Geese who were, you know, really plotting to try and take over the kingship. He, meaning the king, uh, Henry III, had to now align himself with the Protestant Henry of Navarre in 1589. So in other words, uh, Henry, the king, Henry III, goes and arranges to have the Duke of Geese and the cardinal of Guise uh, killed. By the way, that cardinal there, not the bird. It means a church official. Learn that now. A cardinal is a high-ranking official in the Roman Catholic Church, next to the Pope, in fact. He, meaning the king, had to align himself with this other guy, Henry of Navarre, to, because the geese is very powerful. So, Henry the Third. Then, like I said, he before he uh, fell off his horse, died accidentally, and the crown was offered to Henry of Navarre. So, all right, now this is important. So, Henry of Navarre was offered the crown of France, but Henry of Navarre was a Protestant. I know it gets confusing. He's a Protestant. And to become king of France, he has to change his religion. Now, that makes him a what? Makes him a polity. Remember, he changed his religion for the sake of power. Now, the Edict of Nantes was agreed upon uh, in France, and this is very important. The Edict of Nantes was agreed upon, was passed by Henry IV, and made the France, see it, made France the first nation to legalize 
legalize two forms of Christianity. Hmm. understand I don't understand lots of things first nation to legalize two forms of Christianity within its borders it was a religious truce but not much more in about 200 years Louis the 14th will revoke the Edict of Nantes but that's another story for 200 years from now yeah France because of the Edict of Nantes France became the first country in Europe to legalize two forms of Christianity within its borders no other country, not even England, had done this. In England, officially, even when Elizabeth was the, was the uh, monarch, even though she didn't prosecute it much, uh, that much, but officially, Anglicanism was the, uh, pardon me, was the uh, official religion. So, Roman rule six. During this time, Spain was the strongest country in Europe, much due to its pillaging of the New World. Once again, I mean, uh, the Spanish Navy was able to defeat the Turks at the Battle of Lepanto because they had financed their Navy using silver that they literally brought back from the New World by the boatload. Tons of silver at a time. Uh, Philip II owned, and you need to write this down. Oh, look, it's written for you. He owned Spain, of course, also Austria. Bohemia. Where's that? Today it's called the Czech Republic. Yes. Learn. Bohemia, Czech. Bohemia, Czech. Bohemia, Czech. Hungary, Magyar. Hungary, Magyar. Hungary, Magyar. Okay. Holland Dutch. But yes, uh, so um, Bohemia and Hungary. The economically active towns of France, England, and the Netherlands had triple and quadruple their respective populations because France, England, and the Netherlands were becoming were benefiting from the new Atlantic trade. I mean, when Columbus tripped over the uh, the, Amer the Americas, uh, suddenly Spain, Portugal, uh, to a lesser degree Portugal, but uh, France, the UK, uh, England, sorry, and the Netherlands started getting rich because of overseas trade, because of overseas plundering. Actually, the Netherlands became rich because the Netherlands, and you might, you should write this down somewhere, the Netherlands during this period of time, during the 16th and most of the 17th century, the Netherlands was the FedEx of Europe. Yeah, I said FedEx. I said, what does that mean? It means that they shipped everybody else's stuff and collected money for doing it. Okay, uh, Philip II was efficient at running his government, and he was a patron of the arts. In fact, he spent lots of money on the arts uh, during this period of time. Uh, under Philip, Spain had fended off Islam. In what was the largest battle of the 16th century, Don Juan's force destroyed the Turkish fleet at Lepanto. The engagement destroyed one-third of the Turkish fleet and 30,000 sailors. Spain also put down revolts in Portugal and brought uh, many of their lands, Portuguese lands, under Spanish control. Now, the richest part of the Spanish Empire was the Netherlands. Uh, the Netherlands, though, at this time, were predominantly Calvinist. Now, Cal in the Netherlands, uh, it's not called, they're not called Huguenots, they were the Dutch Reformed Church. William of Orange and Orange, or Orange, is a province uh, in the Netherlands, was a true politic. He put his own political aims above religious ones. Notice, he was Catholic until 1567 when he turned Lutheran, and after the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre, he became a Calvinist um, because he wanted to attract French followers 
to his cause. The compromise was when Louis of Nassau, William of Orange's younger brother, I'm in a hurry when I wrote that, um, received a pledge from the Protestants in the Netherlands. Received a pledge from the Protestants in the Netherlands to resist the Council of Trent. Council of Trent, Council of Trent, another word that will be on your test Friday. Yes, the Council of Trent, that agreement where the Catholics agreed to clean up their own church and to further their war against Protestantism. Philip sent the Duke of Alba to put down this budding revolt in the Netherlands. The Council of Troubles, also called the Council of Blood, came to rule over the Netherlands. This was a Spanish council. The Counts of Egmont and Horn and several thousand suspected heretics in the Netherlands were publicly executed. Spain levied new taxes to finance their occupation. The so-called tenth penny tax was a 10% tax, but received so much resistance that it was reduced down to 3% tax, which didn't help at all. So during these years, William of Orange was living in exile uh, in Protestant Germany. This revolt against the Spanish was popular amongst the Dutch people. They did not like Spanish uh, living there. They did not, surely didn't like Spanish atrocities. They didn't like Spanish Catholicism. And there was a group of mercenaries that called the Sea Beggars, a collection of anti-Spanish exiles, mainly English, many of them criminals, which weren't that uncommon, captured the port cities of Brill, Queen Elizabeth, though, in order to maintain good relationships with the Spanish for right now, would not support the sea beggars, would not support Dutch independence, because Queen Elizabeth was trying to keep her head above water. We'll talk more about Queen Elizabeth later on, but Queen Elizabeth not only had to dodge uh, marriage proposals, I really hate that light. Not only had to dodge marriage proposals, but she had to dodge several attempts on her life, including the one sponsored by her first cousin, Mary Queen of Scots. Uh, yeah, so for right now, she was not going to put herself in England into the middle of a uh, war of revolution against the uh, Spanish. The Treaty of Ghent, which is in today is in Belgium, then it was part of the Netherlands, was ravaged in what was called the Spanish Fury. Yeah, the Spanish Fury, basically what happened was that the Spanish sent mercenaries into the Netherlands to put down the Dutch Revolt, only they, uh, they wouldn't pay them. They told the mercenaries, you know, a mercenary is a paid soldier, right? Mercenaries, paid soldier, soldier who fights for money, not for a country. They told the mercenary, you can be paid from what you um, collect from the Dutch. In other words, anything you can snatch. Cattle, property, you know, property, and of course the atrocities they committed. The atrocity was so vicious that, however, that instead of destroying Dutch will, in other words, instead of ham beating down the Dutch, it actually unified. The word I like to use there is galvanize, but maybe you won't remember that. Unified Dutch opinion against the Spanish Habsburgs. In Leiden, the Dutch people opened their own dikes, yikes, and flooded their fields to resist Spanish invasion. You do understand what that means, right? If you've ever seen pictures or read about the Netherlands, the Netherlands is a country where about 30% of what is now the Netherlands was once under sea, under water. And what the Dutch did 
uh, the Dutch are really some creatively ingenious and industrious people. What the Dutch did, they built dikes, dams, to keep out the seawater. Uh, and then they used uh, their other resource, aside from their ingenuity, uh, the wind coming in from the North Sea. And they set up these windmills and the windmills using the wind uh, power would then pump water out of the fields because it really wasn't deep it was just spread out it was a marshland pump water out of the fields back into the ocean and then the land became farmland to this very day yeah but here, the Dutch, those fa Dutch farmers actually broke open their own dikes and flooded their fields so that the Spanish armies could not march across them. As says there, the greatest atrocity in this rebellion was committed by the Spanish unpaid mercenaries in Antwerp uh, on November the 14th, there it is, 1576, and was called the Spanish Fury. This looting and rape massacre of this town galvanized the Dutch across across religious borders. You got to remember that the Netherlands in the Netherlands at that time, yeah, uh, the majority were Dutch Calvinists, uh, Dutch Calvinists, but they had a significant number of also Roman Catholics uh, and, uh, you know, Huguenots uh, and other forms of religion, Jews, for example. And what this is going to happen, and you need to make note of this, you need to make note of this, is that the Netherlands, because they begin, they allowed religious plurality, religious toleration, several forms of religion. Because the Dutch allowed several forms of religion, the Netherlands will become a bastion, that means a stronghold, of liberalism to this very day in Europe. Um, I've never been to Europe, never been to Amsterdam. But you can go to Amster uh, into Amsterdam and they have these, well, I mean, there are places where you can go and smoke marijuana. You buy it off the menu and then you, you can sit there and smoke it. The Dutch, yeah, the Dutch solution to uh, the drug problem is not clamping down on the buyers or the sellers uh, or anything like that. It's tolerance, and tolerance means uh, free needles. Uh, tolerance, you know, the Dutch are less like, yeah, you know, I mean, they will prosecute drug use, but marijuana they don't consider a threat. And so, yeah, you can go to the restaurants. Also, if you go to Amsterdam, they have a red light district. You say, what's a red light? A red light district is a district uh, that caters to sex industry, the sex industry, not just prostitution, but also uh, strip shows, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, where people who want to go can go there. And the industry is regulated by uh, the government. Uh, the people who utilize that, that service and the people who provide that service are monitored uh, in terms of health. Uh, they pay taxes and the Dutch go. But more important than that, the Dutch, and now you're right, the Dutch will become the first country in Europe to allow Jews to legally reside in their borders. Yes, the Dutch were the first country to allow Jews to become residents and, yeah, citizens uh, in the Netherlands. And it's because they have this history of tolerance. I mean, also, uh, the Netherlands right now is the only country in Europe to allow euthanasia. Euthanasia, is that like young people in India? No, I'm just kidding. Uh, no, that's a joke. Pum, pum. Euthanasia, that's assisted suicide. 
Yeah, in the Netherlands, it is legal. So um, the Union of Brussels, which was an agreement of the Dutch, hate that word, to unite across religious lines. All right. How do I misspell all these words? Religious. Across religious lines to fight the Spanish. Anyway, in the Union of Ars, the southern Dutch provinces, who were predominantly Catholic, made sort of a peace with Spain. But in the Union of Utrecht, the northern Dutch areas responded with an alliance of their own. The Spanish were now defeated in the Netherlands, for the most part, even though they kept trying to control the Netherlands, Holland, the Netherlands, Holland, the Netherlands, Holland, the Netherlands, into the 1580s. William of Orange was assassinated in 15, July 1584 and succeeded by his son. Some people call me the Space Cowboy. Some call me the Gangster of Love. Other people call me, yes, sir, Maurice. You like that, Mr. Arlinghouse? Anyway, uh, was succeeded by his son, Maurice. Philip II, the King of Spain. Began to meddle more and more directly in the affairs of England and France. Yes, unwelcome so. In 1596, France and England formally recognized the independence of the Netherlands. And why don't we end there, Roman numeral 7, which is where we'll pick up tomorrow and talk about uh, the Protestant, the uh, Elizabeth, the Elizabethan age in England and the uh, defeat of the Spanish Armada. Yeah, we'll talk about it there. Thank you so much.